Tony Shostrang, and I'm here to introduce the speaker. Uh, I've been doing this job of introducing the speaker for the Hofstadter Memorial Lectures for a good number of years now. And it's always a pleasure, and I'm glad to see that you're all here. Um, well, let me just get uh, started quickly. This is the 2015 Robert Hofstadter Memorial Lecture. <coughs> Those two people up on the top, on the left is Robert Hofstadter. Robert Hofstadter was one of the great experimental physicists of the 20th century. Uh, I suspect a good number of you are old enough and knew exactly who Bob Hofstadter was. Bob Hofstadter was one of the pioneers of elementary particle physics. For those who are not old enough to know, I will tell you exactly what he was most famous for, although he did many, many things in physics. Uh, his Nobel laureate uh, contribution for physics was for the discovery of something very remarkable at the time. It was a little before my time. Oh, it was a, it's not quite right. It was thought before Bob Hofstadter that the proton was like the electron, the point particle, so small that it would have no structure. Bob decided to study that problem, and so what did he do? He did exactly what Rutherford did. What Rutherford did was to scatter particles off an atom and discover there was a little core in the center called the nucleus. What Bob did was he scattered electrons. What did I say? Did I say that, uh, that somebody scattered electrons off? Uh, uh, alpha particles. Yeah. Um, Bob scattered electrons of protons and neutrons and deuterons and, uh, and, 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 and um, a nuclei and so forth and made the great discovery that the proton and the neutron were not point particles, that they were little globs of something. This, of course, played out in the end, uh, played a big part of my career played out in the end that protons were little globs of quarks and gluons and other stuff, but the pioneer who started the subject was Robert Hofstadter. There were two things that people said about Robert Hofstadter over and over and over again. One was that he was a brilliant experimental physicist with an extraordinary instinct for the subject, and the other that he was an extraordinarily kind, kind man. Uh, by the time I knew Bob, um, well, it was already too late for us to interact as physicists. He was getting toward retirement. I was more interested in theoretical things. But um, I did, I was at the end of his kindness. I'm mean, not the end of his kindness. I'm the recipient of his kindness. <laughs> the first time I met him, I was 20 years old. I was an undergraduate at CCNY at City College. And Bob had been a student there, and he came back to give a colloquium when he won the Nobel Prize, and he took me in hand and sat me down and said, young man, you need to be a physicist because I can tell you love the subject. Well, enough about me. In any case, Bob was an extraordinarily kind man. So we're here to celebrate his great career as an experimental physicist, and of course, we're also here to celebrate the work of Anton Zeilinger, who is also one of the great <laughs> experimental physicists the 20th century and the 21st century. His subject is very different. It's the subject of quantum mechanics, quantum information theory. We live in a world now of information, of course. Everything is information. Quantum information is very special and very peculiar. It's dominated by a subject called entanglement. And Anton is truly one of the heroes of the entanglement revolution, a hero both for his experimental work on the subject, which you'll talk about, but Anton was also one of the discoverers of a theoretical thing called, well, we'll come to it, let's say what it is, but I want to point out one thing to you that I think is interesting. Uh, this was not entirely due to Anton's work. This is a graph which represents the number of papers every year with the word entanglement in their, in their title. I don't know if you've seen this before. Uh, this is the number of papers coming from HEC-TH, from the Theoretical Physics Archive. Uh, Anton's contributions were way down at the very beginning there. 
And one of his contributions, I'm going to show you, these papers are escalating very, very rapidly. I'm going to show you one very, very recent paper that actually, that actually does not have entanglement in its title, but it has something called EPR. EPR was Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen. Incidentally, ER equals EPR. That's an acronym, not an equation. <laughs> On both sides of the equation, the E is Einstein. Then there's GHZ. The Z is Zeilinger. So two Einsteins and a Zeilinger. Impressive. <laughs> you know that I've, uh, that I've um, not uh, included the author of the paper. I don't include the author of the paper. <laughs> <laughs> Anton is the recipient of many, many awards and honors. I'll just mention two, the Wolf Prize and the Newton Prize, and leave the rest up for Anton. Anton, please. Here. Uh, the top is, is his paper, the bottom is our work. 
So it was a, a, a paper published in 1967 by Yaki Aharanov. Uh, for, for those of you who don't know it, he's one of the leading theoretical physicists in the foundation of quantum mechanics. <coughs> and uh, Leonard Susskind, who uh, apparently was a fledgling young scientist at that time, probably. And it's about the observability of the sign change of spinners under two pi rotations. What it means is that I, if I take any system whatsoever, like, like this little bag here, and if I rotate the system by, one, by two pi, then it's 360 degrees, once around, it's the same system. And the point is that spinners, spin one half, quantum states of spin one half particles do not have the feature. You have to rotate them twice to get the same state. And there was a suggestion by, by uh, Aranov and Saskan that this might be observable in principle. It was, a, uh, it was with electron states across some boundary, something like that. I don't remember the details. Uh, and uh, we did the experiment a couple of years later, maybe in 1975. So it was not so, not so, so, so your paper was quite hungry. Uh, you did not know about Newton in the parameter which came into existence. And, and we did not know about your work. In the beginning, we started our work independently, but then we discovered that you have been uh, ahead of, of, of this. Uh, I just point out how the system, how the system works. This was, uh, was meta wave interferometry, this massive meta wave, uh, which uh, proceeded uh, all the famous uh, uh, atom interferometry work. Uh, and I like to call it the, the atom interferometer with the atom with the z equals zero. So that's <laughs> quite clear. Right? Now the interferometer was developed by Helmut Rauch, who was my PhD supervisor. And this was not my PhD thesis, it was afterwards. So we simply have a neutron beam, which is split by diffraction <coughs> into two parts. The scale is here, so this is microscopic, this is large, into two amplitudes. And recombined, you have superpositions of the two amplitudes. In one, on the one of the parts, the, the uh, neutron is subject to a variable magnetic field, and therefore the spin is rotated uh, by whatever you want. And when you look at the outcome intensity, they show periodic oscillations as a function of the B field, and the period is for pi, just as you would expect. There were two parallel experiments simultaneously, one by us in, in, in Europe, and the other one by Werner, Colella, uh, and, and, and colleagues here, here in, the, in, the, in the United States. So this was my, my, my first connection with you, and I'm happy to be here, here again for this kind of talk. Uh, just for the general audience, uh, to uh, give a few small definitions and a few points, uh, uh, the kind of uh, the whole sofila equivalent for discussion, discussing foundations of quantum mechanics is the double slit experiment. Uh, this is a, a, a sketch which was made by Niels Bohr. There uh, was a very famous discussion in the early days of quantum mechanics, late 1920s, early 1930s, about not about uh, not so much about whether quantum mechanics is the correct theory or not. There was a little bit of that too, but not very much. But it was about what what does it mean? What does it mean for our understanding of the of, of the world? What does it mean for us? Weltbild, Weltanschauung. I think there's no good English word for for Weltbild or Weltanschauung. And uh, the uh, this experiment played a, a crucial role there. Uh, the point here, uh, Bohr and Einstein, at some moment where apparently uh, you know, always, uh, Einstein always challenged this kind of quantum view, and Bohr was then able to show that Einstein was wrong. But the, the ideas of Einstein were not silly, so one should not dismiss it easily. These are very clever, clever ideas. And they are always Gedanken experiments, thought experiments, because you were not able at that time to do the experiments yet for technological reasons. Today we can do all these experiments. And here's a moment, apparently, where Einstein had, a, had a, won the day. He was the winning, and Warhol kind of desperate. That's why he took a lot of evidence. He might The point is very simple. The physicists forgive that I go completely that I go through it. Uh, this is a, a picture done by Niels Bohr, uh, written up, and he wrote up his dialogue with Einstein. And I like the big picture for, for, for various reasons. One of them is, uh, you know, Niels Bohr was a theoretical physicist. 
but he knew what's important in an experiment. Like, look at this cruise here. Yeah. <laughs> 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 They're really important, otherwise this will be falsified. Okay, anyway, so the, the, the point is very simple. We have light coming from the left, going through this, uh, this slit, slit opening, and then we have another diaphragm with the two openings, and in the end we can observe. Uh, we observe, when we do the experiment with the right conditions, we observe bright and dark stripes called fringes. Now this is easily understood if you know that light is a wave, and, uh, on the, and you have two waves which go through the two slits here, and then the dark places, the two waves just cancel each other, and the bright places, they enforce each other. Now the problem comes when you know that light consists of photons of individual particles, as suggested by Einstein in 1905. And then the question is, does this phenomenon exist for, in, uh, where, where, where does, where, uh, what does it, how does it happen when you know that these are bunches of particles? Uh, if, if they're really realistic particles, they would go through either this, each one would go through either here or here, as uh, Einstein argues. Then if it goes through here, how should it know that the other slit is open or not? Because the fringes only arise when both slits are open. Now, Einstein made here the, a wrong prediction. This is, uh, it was in, like this, in, in, in 1909, at the conference in Salzburg, he predicted that if you do the experiment, with individual particles, one at a time, you don't see the phenomenon. You only see the many go through at the same time. Today we know that this was wrong. And uh, the old way to look at it is that, that, uh, that uh, you should, I mean, the general point is you should not attribute properties to a quantum system without actually using, applying the apparatus which allows you to find out whether this property is there or not. So the path taken by the party is not a, a, a feature of reality unless you really determine the path. So it does not make sense to talk about the path taken without doing an experiment. And the old way to say is, is that, that uh, they, as soon as you look at it, for example, if you scan the light here, you destroy the interference pattern because of the interaction. The modern way to talk about this, the more modern way, and and uh, Professor Sass kind of already alluded to the notion of, of information, is that interference arises if and only if no path information is present anywhere in the universe, be it on the particle or be it outside. So this is a criteria. This is a, is a, is a new way to, to, to look at the whole thing. Just to show you one old picture here, this is in, in 1988, uh, this uh, kind of phenomenon, this individual neutrons. Uh, one neutron at a time. The experiment was such a real the experiment. The experiment was such that when one neutron was registered, the next one to be registered was still sitting in, in its uranium nucleus, waiting for fission to set it free. So it's only one at a time. And the interesting point that the solid line is, is first principle theory without any free parameter, uh, besides the total intensity. Uh, now, uh, this is today standard fare in many laboratories with atoms, with what you name it, with whatever, with complicated systems. At that time, when I gave the talk, there were even famous, famous professors who walked up to me afterwards and said, Really? It works that way? Right? <laughs> <laughs> this is completely interesting. Here's the same experiment for buckyballs, for large molecules. Uh, 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 and, uh, the only important message I want to give here, or that, uh, which you might find interesting, is that uh, this kind of phenomenon also works uh, work, uh, for temperatures of the molecules up to 3,000 Kelvin. So you are not so you are not restricted to low temperatures, and if we make simple scale estimates, we can estimate that you know they think that the problem is decoherence, which is that flow of information from the quantum system to the environment. And if you, uh, if you make simple estimates, you can really esti uh, easily estimate that it should be possible to see this kind of thing for objects of the size of small viruses at room temperature. And that would really be interesting if that ever happens. Now, we come to entanglement, that, that, the title of my talk. It all goes back to this famous paper by Einstein, Kudorsky, Rosen, already mentioned in the introduction, it's the EPR, not the 
ER, I cannot say anything about ER, I'm not a specialist in this, this, in, uh, this kind of physics, not at all. Uh, this is a famous EPR paper, uh, which has interesting here, philosophical sounding talk. Can quantum mechanical description of physical reality be considered complete? Uh, I don't want to go into that discussion. It's very interesting, it's a very difficult paper to read if you know quantum mechanics. <laughs> because you have to shed, yes, it's true, I'm not kidding you, you have to share all your quantum in, in, uh, instincts. And then it's interesting. Uh, as long as you don't do that, it's, it's a problem. Now, uh, this paper is not, is not famous now for the, for the, for the question of, uh, you know, the, the, the physical description of physical reality is complete or not, the title, but it introduced the notion of entanglement. Uh, where the basic point simply is that if you uh, you can have a situation where you have two systems which interacted in the past and uh, which are then connected in a novel way in quantum mechanics called entanglement in such a way that that uh, one way that they only have a joint quantum state they don't have an individual quantum state or more strictly speaking. The, the, uh, the information which describes the system is only defined in joint properties and not in properties of the individuals. And this is something which cannot exist in classical physics. In classical physics, you only have correlations if you have correlata, if you have something which is correlated. Uh, David Merman says quantum entanglement is, is, uh, is correlation without correlata. So it's just the correlation which is defined, not the, not the properties themselves. Uh, Here is the, the quote, I don't know if you have seen this, where the original quote where Einstein calls this spooky action. It's a letter to Max Bohr, uh, written in December 1947. I read it in English. Uh, I cannot uh, uh, really believe into the theory uh, uh, in it, namely quantum mechanics, because the theory uh, is, uh, cannot be brought in agreement with the principle that physics has to describe a reality in space and time without independent spooky action at the distance. This is spooky action at the distance because it's instantaneous and whatsoever. There's a lot which can be said now that this is not a problem because you cannot communicate the factors and the speed of light with it and so on. Uh, that's besides uh, the point now. But you see already here the, 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 the essence of the problem. The essence of the problem is that the idea that physics describes a reality in space and time independent of our observation, this is not said yet, that position is not tenable anymore. And the question is, what is tenable? I will come back to that, to that in a moment. Here is what New York Times wrote about the einstein Bukowski wrote in paper. Einstein attacks quantum theory. Ein scientist and two colleagues find it is not complete, even so correct. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but what I find so charming about it is that it says, scientists and two colleagues, and you publish it as Einstein. <laughs> Uh, this is a, a symbolization which brings home the essence again, and I will try it uh, according to Schrödinger. Erwin Schrödinger, in the same year, shortly after the uh, EPR paper, wrote about entanglement, and I was also always wondering why he was able to do that so shortly after, and it turns out that he had worried about the notion already since about 1930. Okay, and, I, and, and, and Schrödinger says, in, 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 in the language of that type, it means, uh, when he, to him, the quantum state is an expectation catalog. It's a, a catalog of expectation of possible future measurement results. And he says, quantum entanglement means that you have an expectation catalog for joint observations on two systems, but you have no expectation catalogs for the individuals. And this is just in a different way the modern language. You have the information which only exp expresses possible future results, but not, not uh, individual results. Uh, this can be signified in the right here as if this were quantum dice. You know, quantum dice, uh, future quantum dice, uh, which are intended, and they don't exist yet, but I believe that they will exist in the year 2100 or whatever. They will be the standard. Uh, holiday season present is passing out. <laughs> <laughs> 
And the common ties have the feature that if you throw the ties, they always you put them in the cup, you know, shake the cup and show that, and they show the same number. So uh, again, show that they again show now another number in general, the usual probability in one and six, but always the same number. And then you look at them, you investigate them, you find out that there's no hidden mechanism which makes this happen, and there's no connection between them. And this is the, this, the, the uh, nature of entanglement. And this is why, by showing a code called entanglement, uh, the uh, uh, most uh, fundamental uh, uh, property of quantum mechanics, which forces us to abandon, as he says, uh, our cherished views of the world. Now, I will talk about some of the possible consequences, uh, conceptual uh, consequences at the end, but it, it probably means, it, it means that we have to give up some of our cherished ways how to look at the world. Now, here's where you uh, In Alpbach in Tirol, it's a small advertisement to come to Austria. <laughs> There's a Schoenig equation written by his grandson, actually, his name is Terry Rudolph, who is also a well-known theoretician at the Imperial College in London, uh, who works in quantum information. By the way. Now here's the analog to your, to your picture, which you showed. These are the citations of the einstein bodowski rosen paper over the years according to the Science Citation Index. And you see that there are very few citations in the beginning. Uh, as far as I know, there are only five. Uh, so, and then there was nothing for a long time. So that paper would not have given Gerten Einstein a tenure position. <laughs> <laughs> Some people will say today it was justified because it turned out to be wrong. The, the basic concept of reality of realism turned out to be wrong. But, but, on the, but the quotations were not so bad because two were from Schrödinger and one was from the Spohr. So it's not such a bad way to discuss <laughs> Uh, anyway, then nothing happened for a long time. And you see, there are two uh, uh, um, instances when this really changed. There was a little of, of citations in the six, early 60s, and then it takes off at around 1970, because uh, in 1964, 65, John Bell, Irish physicist, discovered that the conceptual, the conceptual ideas of the einstein podolsky rosen paper are in conflict with some prediction of quantum mechanics for some specific situations. And that is now very interesting, because you can go to the lab and you can ask nature what is, what is true, what is correct. And apparently, many people at that time shrugged their shoulders and said, OK, sure, now it's clear that this is wrong. But apparently, no experiment existed where even implicitly this was tested. So this started a whole long period of experiments. And the second virtual explosion happened around 2000. And this was when, to the surprise of everyone who was early in the field, and I talked to nearly all of them, uh, it turned out that entanglement might, might be useful for something, namely quantum information, quantum computation, uh, quantum communication, and so on and so on. Today, the paper is quoted uh, uh, typically one, once a day on the average, which I would like to submit uh, does not mean that it's read more often than it's <laughs> That's a different story. That's a different, that's a different question. Now here's John Bell, uh, who discovered actually uh, that some predictions of, of quantum mechanics, the very basic predictions are in conflict with the, with the conceptual notion of the einstein bogosky rosen paper. The notion of the einstein bogosky rosen paper is called local realism. Namely, that what you observe in an experiment is uh, 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 given under two conditions, or two conditions. One is that it reflects a property which is present already there before you do the observation, A, that there is realism. And the second one is that what you measure, measure there is independent of what somebody else decides to do at that very moment at a distant location. That very moment meaning that no communication uh, can, uh, can, can explain what you see because any communication is limited by the speed of light. Okay? Now this is the, the combination of these two is called local views. Here is a quintessential experiment the way they are done now today in many laboratories. You have a source, quelle means quelle means source. 
which produces two uh, photons. One is sent to the right, the other one to the left, and their polarizations are measured. And it turns out, just when the way you look at it, is that the two, polar the two polarizations are, when you measure linear polarization, are either both horizontal or both vertical. Okay? The, uh, I don't go into the details how the source uh, works. It's basically a some nonlinear orbital phenomenon usually, but it can be a common case case in it. Now the idea is wrong. The following idea is wrong according to, to uh, quantum mechanics. It is wrong to assume that half of the photons are emitted with this kind of polarization, the other one, the other half of the pairs are emitted with this kind. This idea is wrong. Uh, what happens is that you have a superposition, the way it's written down here. Both photons are horizontally, or both photons are vertically polarized. And you have a superposition of the two, which in the same sense as in the double state experiment, doesn't, it means that the polarization of the individuals is not a property of reality. You cannot talk about the polarization. They themselves don't even know until you do the, do the measurement. But when you measure one, I get either horizontal or vertical, which instantly, as we say, collapses the quantum state of the other one into the corresponding polarization of beta alpha, the other one is away. And this now, that's the second important piece of information you might ask, horizontal and vertical like this, is gravity important? No. Or horizontal and vertical like that, or like that, and the use is it doesn't matter. In any basis you get these correlations which can only be, which can only be explained by a quantum state. Now there's a, a charming little article for for, uh, for uh, uh, those of you who uh, are not physicists, and uh, people always say that you can now use it to explain uh, the phenomenon to your grandmother, but well, this is a sexist remark, you can use it to explain it to your grandfather as well. <laughs> there's, no, there's no difference between the two. Uh, and this, this is a, a, a charming paper written by John Bell himself, it's called Bertelmann's Socks and the Nature of Reality. You find it on the internet, it's very simple. The story is, is quite simple. This guy Bertelmann actually, actually exists. He's a colleague of mine in Vienna who used to work with Bell at CERN. And the, the story is very simple. Dr. Bertelmann likes to wear two socks of different colors. He always does that. He's now condemned to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Which color he will have on the given foot on the given day is quite unpredictable. But when you see that the first sock is pink, you can be already sure that the second sock will not be pink. <laughs> okay? <laughs> so it comes around the corner. <laughs> Observation of the first and experience uh, of Bertelmann gives immediate information about the second. And then the question is, and is not the EPR business just the same? And the answer is no, it's not the same. If this were quantum entangled socks, they, they would not have their colors before the, the, the first observation of the socks is made. And afterwards, uh, they have, afterwards they have the properties. And it's a very nice to explain in, in this paper. Now, I mentioned that there has been, I want to go through a, a, a couple of, of, of recent experiments and ongoing experiments, and I will come to some of the uh, conceptual uh, issues at the end of the talk here. Uh, there has been a long story of experiments which, conf which confirm, with one exception, one of the first experiments, which all confirm the prediction of quantum mechanics. But there are some loopholes in these experiments. Uh, loophole meaning that the experiments are not perfect. There are still ways for a local realist to save his neck. Uh, and uh, the loopholes are the following. The, the most important loopholes are the following. What is the communication loophole? Which says maybe there is an unknown communication, physics beyond current physics, uh, between the two sides, where, where this side knows what is uh, uh, being measured on the, on the other side. Uh, 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 there's some communication between the pieces of the parameters. Okay? That could explain the results. So the way to rule this out is to rapidly change what you measure on this side, rapidly change it so fast that there's not enough time for the information to go to the other side. <laughs> there have been experiments about that. Uh, the first one, the two of the forces that time was by Aspe, there was another one by us in Innsbruck, and so on. So that loophole is closed for photons. There is another loophole, the fair sampling loophole. I will uh, say a little bit more about that. And that is simply they assume that nature is really vicious, 
Glacius wishes in the following way: if you don't, if you don't have a perfect detector, if you don't, if you are not able to detect all particles, you only detect a fraction of them. Uh, uh, may, uh, nature could play a dirty game with you, namely giving you only those particles which seem to obey quantum mechanics. <laughs> and it, it can be shown that such model uh, is valid up to uh, collection efficiencies of about uh, two thirds. So as soon as you detect more than those, uh, that loophole doesn't work anymore. And there has been a history of, of closing this loophole. Uh, it was first closed by Dave Feynman and his people in, in 1990, sorry, in 2000 in uh, Rosetta. And the other one is called the freedom of choice loophole. Maybe that means that if you choose, if you choose, uh, the question is, uh, somebody has to choose what polarization is being measured here, or any other property. Now, uh, the, uh, the problem is if there is a common unknown co cause for the two to determine what the is measured, then you could also explain this in the local realist way. Now, this, this loophole cannot be closed for any arbitrary unknown cause way back into the universe, but I will mention some, uh, something about that in a moment. Now, just to, to uh, in the interest of time, this is an experiment we did a long time ago with closing the communication loophole. It's not so interesting. This is about the about the fair sampling loophole, uh, about the, the freedom of choice loophole, a certain variant, but that is also not very interesting. These are some fair sampling experiments uh, done. The first one was, uh, the top one is the one by the Vineland group. They experiment <coughs> with other uh, entangled atoms. Chris Monroe and the people, there is a group uh, 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 that experiments on, on uh, superconducting qubits and so on. Uh, to close the fair sampling group on these photos is, is a challenge because detectors with high quantum efficiency don't exist for a long time. Uh, Here is how such an experiment works, which we did not long ago. You have uh, the photons created in this kind of setup here. It's a, it's a, I don't have to go into details. Here's a nonlinear crystal which is pumped from a, from a laser pump, uh, either this way or this way, and in the end you get uh, polarization entangled photons coming out here. One is go, goes this way, one goes that way. They, are, they can be uh, separated by having, for example, a slightly different wavelength or whatever you name it. It's not important. Uh, uh, and, and then uh, you detect the photons with what is called transition edge superconducting detectors. These are small, tiny superconductors which are driven at the transition edge and they have a quantum efficiency as close to 100% as you want. The name of the game is to get the photons into the detector. So in that experiment, uh, we were able to close the detection loophole. There was a single experiment uh, uh, basically at the same time by the Paul Clear group in, in, in North Urbana Champagne. And the final goal, what is missing, is a five. So, so all the loopholes have been closed, uh, all the major loops have been closed for photons. Photons are the first particle where all the loopholes have been closed. This is, by the way, not just playing games. It is also known that a definitive loophole free experiment would finally prove that what is called uh, uh, unconditional quantum cryptography is possible without any additional assumption. Uh, now, what is missing is a final experiment which called closes all loopholes at once in one experiment. There are a number of experiments going on. We are working on one. Uh, 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 Mike Schwerter in Munich is working on one. A group in Delft is working on one, and so on and so on. I just want to point out that there is a, a further step way of it. The question is, as I said, as I said before, you have your two photons, the two particles, and they are measured uh, using some apparatus. And you have to decide uh, the polarization setting or whatever you want, right? Uh, here, uh, this is the measurement result. Here is the polarizer setting. <laughs> say. And the question is, how independent can the sources of that information be? And there was the there was the suggestion uh, already in the early days that you could uh, that you could use cosmic sources, independent cosmic sources. Uh, set very far away, in such a way that there was no, but nearly no communication since the early days of the universe. 
Uh, now, independently, not knowing that this was actually discussed in the early days, the whole thing was proposed again by these colleagues here at MIT uh, in 2013. And we are now jointly pursuing this idea. And we have uh, uh, support by Alan Goose who tells us something which I don't fully understand, uh, that you can have regions of space where, they, where the two uh, quasars or whatever it is are causally disconnected in a way that they, they could have never have uh, talked to each other, maybe except at the very beginning or something like that. So this is a realistic experimental program. We are working on it, and we might do it in the next uh, two or three years. Now to the applications, possible applications. One is quantum cryptography, where you have Alice and Bob who are connected with a quantum <coughs> channel, which establishes a, 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 a key, which encrypt, allows you to encrypt the information. And Alice and Bob, who can then talk about the classic channel, like uh, ancient phones or whatever. Uh, to, uh, in a secure way by, by using the key established across the quantum channel. And the eavesdropper <laughs> listening onto the communication uh, it, 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 it can, has no chance whatsoever to find out what the information was which they uh, exchanged. All he can do is he can interrupt the possibility that they that they uh, can talk to each other. The technique is, yes, of course, the first experiment which we did a long time ago, uh, which I just showed to you because of this funny side effect. And now we, what we did is we, we sent around this lady here. And the reason why we picked the lady was that when we did the experiment, my colleagues came up with a suggestion to use some, some um, uh, stealth bombers or something like that, some military. And I told them you have to come up with something which fulfills two conditions. It is a peaceful symbol and it, uh, it is austere. <laughs> and this is a peaceful austere symbol. It's a, a figure 26,000 years ago from Austria. It probably is not, it's not a military symbol, right? <laughs> <laughs> But they do it. So, so, the, so the point is very simple. I mean, you basically have here the key, which was established by, by measuring measuring about 60,000 intended pairs of photons, and then represented in a, a random pattern, just transformed into some color pattern, and the two key keys are nearly identical. You mix bit by bit. You mix, mix the original with the with the with the with the key, and this is what we send along. And because the keys are random and only used once. The communications. Now the technology is, is the technology on the basis of of low data rates, 100 kilo uh, bit per second or whatever is rather is rather uh, uh, well established. There was a network test, for example, in Tokyo, where they go for the other experiments. The big challenge here is the, these high data rates. If you to go to to, to uh, uh, data rates, we we. Uh, beyond like one megabit per second, uh, you need to really develop better sources and better detectors, which in my opinion is just a matter of investment. It's not a question of principle, but it will take a lot of money to get, to get there. Another charming possible application of these ideas, it's a step further, is called blind quantum computing. It's the following idea, the following challenge. Suppose you are a customer here, and you want to use a sexual server, uh, and you want to make sure that the sexual, the person who operates the sexual uh, server has no, has no knowledge whatsoever uh, 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 which data you are using, but also no knowledge whatsoever which kind of program, which kind of problem you are taking. Are you analyzing the stock market, or are you, or are you just playing chess, or whatsoever? And it turns out that these, these people, uh, uh, Broadband fits Simon's Kashevi and the elegant idea that, uh, that this can be can be uh, 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 solved using uh, quantum communication ideas. The point simply is that they send the client sends to the quantum server quantum bits, qubits, uh, systems which have two states, zero and one, but in the general uh, quantum state. And the server has to build this quantum computing registry uh, called the cluster state out of these qubits. And since he doesn't know what the information contained is in the original qubits, he has no idea what is going on. 
and then he does some measurements on the state, uh, uh, which which then uh, perform the, 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 the computation, sends the measurement results back to the customer, and the customer can then identify the information. This is in principle a, a fantastic idea. There are some experiments going on. This is an active field of research. And I just show you, this was just to show you some of the possibilities. Let's go back to the Canary Islands uh, for you to relax a little. Here's a picture of the Canary Islands, the link between La Palma and Tenerife. On La Palma and Tenerife, both islands, you have clusters of telescopes. It's about a dozen telescopes on each island. So it's, it's all different. It's all, you know, research infrastructure there and everything. And we just use that for our, for our experiments. Here's the receiving station again. Here is the receiving station in the cross section on, on, on the island of Tenerife. All this is, as a, is at an altitude of two and a half thousand meters, which is also very good for, for, the, for the atmospheric conditions. Here's a picture from the sending station over to the receiving station. The green line you see is a real laser beam. It's a beacon laser. It's not used in the community. It's a beacon laser such that the two telescopes, the sending telescope and the receiving telescope, they have to be continuously adjusted to, to, to see each other, to be linked very well because of atmospheric fluctuations. Uh, now here's a picture of, of uh, one of the first experiments which we did there. The sending station on La Palma. Uh, the receiving station on La Palma, we create pairs of metallic particles. We measure one of them locally. We send the other one over to Tenerife. And then we we, uh, we can uh, we see the tangent between both sides and so on. The disadvantage or the challenge is that, all, uh, that uh, typically only one out of every th out of thousand photons arrives. Basically because of scattering and because of, it's mainly because of geometrical limitations and so on. There are ways to overcome that uh, in principle by using adaptive optics which we simply have not done yet because there is enough to do, interesting to do without it. Now I come to teleportation. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah, here again, this is, this is fantastic. I don't know why. There's always this, there's always, as you see, there's supposed to be some equation here, some strong formula. <laughs> and I always put it in, and when I show the talk, it disappears. <laughs> 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 What was what's written in here is what is written here too. It's just a copy of this box. For some reason it doesn't work. <laughs> anyway, the idea of quantum teleportation is 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 a, it was an idea by Bennett Bazar, Gregor, uh, Pierres and Gutes in 1993. It's very elegant. I want to uh, uh, here there is the, the, the mathematics. But I want to kind of uh, tell you the idea from an information point of view. Uh, the challenge is that Alice here has a quantum state which she wants Bob to have. And let us assume for and this is only one system. It's not ten or thousand, so you cannot measure measure the ensemble and determine the quantum state. Uh, the simple solution would be that you just sense the quantum state over the but let's assume that at the moment when they communicate, there is no such link available as possible. The solution is quantum teleportation. So what, what you do is you, they, uh, Alice and Bob share an intended pair. They share an intended pair. And one of the two, uh, let's talk about photons for simplicity, and these are the polarizations of photons. One of the two is sent to Alice, the other one is sent to Bob. Now rem remember that entanglement is is a quantum state where the individuals have no value defined properties. These two states do not have a polarization. But the relationship is defined. In the experiment, let us con consider the case where this state is, say, an antisymmetric state. It's a state where the two polarizations are always different in any, in any, in any uh, measurement basis. Then what Alice does is she entangles these two with each other. You might ask, how can you do it? Entanglement means that the two lose their identity in a sense. You have, you have to make sure that they lose their identity. And I will show you how this is done. But, and the effect then is that, that these two are becoming entangled with each other, 
And these are entangled in the right state, namely in the in this what we call anti-symmetric state before, then you know the following. You know that this one, this one is, is orthogonal to that one. This one is opposite to that one. From the beginning, you have the information that this one is opposite to that one. Opposite, opposite means that this state is the same as this one. This is just in the language of information. You can write it down in quantum mechanics and so on. So by that, so it simply means that this state now is the same as the original was, was because the original has become entangled with the with the source. So the original has lost, it's not fluxing, it's not copying, it, the original has lost its features and the other one has the same properties. So the other one is the, is the original, the original now. <laughs> we have transferred all the information over to the other one. It is the original from a Concept from the from the mental point of view, it has all the properties of the original. This is this undisturbed, undisturbed. So it has been teleported to the other side. Okay. Now uh, uh, the way how to identify actually this this uh, how to perform these uh, uh, entanglement measurements is very simple. I want to go. Uh, 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 suppose I have two, I have here 50 50 beam splitter and I have two bosons incident. Two, like two photons, you, have, you know, and, uh, in, a, in a standard uh, quantum state, you name it, whatever it is, it could be, for example, this symmetric state, 1, 0, plus 0, 1. And then, uh, and so, uh, well, what can happen? Then it could happen that, that uh, uh, both photons uh, pass through. Uh, both photons are reflected, this is a 50-50 beam splitter, or one is reflected, one goes through, and so on. It turns out that if these two are bosons and they arrive at the same time in the symmetric state, they always come out together. So they always come out here, both here, or both here. So far, nice, uh, but not very new, not very important for the experiment. What's important for the experiment is that there's one state, if I have two quantum bits, there's one state which is anti-symmetric, even for photons. And it turns out that for the anti-symmetric state, the two possibilities, that the two photons are both transmitted or both deflected, they interfere constructively. And they are the only possibility of what can happen. So it means simply, if I now, uh, this is the coincidence counter, the right time difference, if I detect one photon here and I detect one photon here, I know that they have been projected onto the anti-symmetric state. And this is a unique way how to identify one specific entangled state. And that is what, is what was the workhorse in our experiments for a long time. Here's a picture of a recent uh, quantum teleportation experiment, the same story between, uh, between uh, La Palma and Tenerife. There was a similar experiment by the group of Chi and by Tan in in China, and uh, uh, right. So, how much time do I have? Well, not very much. So, I have to kind of come to a to an end. Uh, a conceptually very interesting feature. Let us let us go on here. Is called is called uh, uh, entanglement swapping, and there is an interesting uh, uh, property here. Uh, let, let's look at this for a moment. Entanglement swapping or teleportation of entanglement is the following uh, uh, property that you have uh, two entangled pairs produced by two sources and you entangle one particle, one photon from each of the two sources. And by that procedure, you entangle the outer two ones which have no common past, uh, you entangle when it's just in the standard way. So uh, this kind of procedure is considered to be important for possible future uh, quantum, uh, uh, quantum uh, repeaters connecting uh, uh, quantum computers over large networks. I don't want to go into details. This is a, an experiment on quantum, uh, 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 quantum uh, uh, entanglement swapping, uh, which we did recently did in Tenerife. But again, it's an interesting feature by basically a simple chain of logic. You know how in these two original entangled states, how the two states 
this, uh, relate to each other. Here you know how they relate to each other. The projection of the rectangle state defines a relationship between these two photons, and therefore the outer two ones are related to each other. But all this is only about correlation, nothing. This is a picture of the experiment, but that's not, not something really really. Here's the future. The future is in space. Uh, we are working on, uh, together with the Chinese Academy of Sciences, we are working on a quantum satellite, and I understand that there's a small quantum race, space, quantum space race going on. Uh, there are, there are, uh, there are uh, uh, actually Japanese people are working on this, colleagues from Singapore, uh, uh, and, and uh, we are working with China. And I, I don't know anything about the US activity, I only know from the U.S. colleague that the fact that we are collaborating with China is very important for them. <laughs> so, that's what he told me. Now, I want to show you a little movie before I come to the end of the talk. It's a little movie which shows you how you can use uh, uh, such states for, for communication. Right now it's a classical movie, but, but we already have the quantum uh, analog. There are properties of light which are not so well known, that, uh, that which have recently been, been put to work. And this is besides the polarization of the light beam, shown on the left hand side, linear or circular polarization, there is something called orbital angular momentum of states. And that means that these states have, don't have a, a flat wave front, as it is indicated here, but they have screw type wave fronts. And these states have all kinds of interesting uh, features. I will talk more about this tomorrow in my, in my physics colloquium. But today, I just want to uh, uh, talk about an, an, an experiment which we did. There are a number of papers. It's always nice if this happens. There are a number of, of publications where people argue that these states cannot be used for communication uh, uh, over distances of more than one kilometer because they, are, they have this complicated wavefront and that is very susceptible to disturbance by the atmosphere. Well, it turns out that they are not right. Because we did an experiment over three kilometers, and right now my group is on the Canary Islands doing experiments over 150 kilometers. Uh, it is always interesting to look at the assumptions, what goes wrong in the original ideas. I can tell you that in the discussion if you want. Uh, here is the, the photograph of the experiments in Vienna, and here is a small, a small movie I show you about this experiment. There's actually some music. The music is some Brazilian music from the 1920s. Uh, I don't know. I don't know how to start this thing in a better way. I'm really ignorant about this kind of things. <laughs> So these are the letters of an alphabet. So using these states, you can have alphabets which are not just zero and one. So these are the various letters of the alphabets you can use for each individual photon. So for each photon, can carry much more information than just a uh, just a bit. Thank you. 
come to the end of my talk story. I want to discuss some of the uh, uh, conceptual possibilities. We have seen entanglement is something which works. It works just as quantum mechanics predicts, and it can be used to all kinds of, all kinds of, 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 of applications. But what are the consequences for our worldview? What are the possibilities? Uh, now, one, I, one possibility would be to say that locality is wrong. It is wrong to assume that what is observed here is independent of what somebody else does by the way. Another possibility is, is that, uh, which is never, can never be ruled out in anything we do, is that the universe is totally deterministic, mm -hmm. including the choices of what you do in experiment, which in my eyes would be the end of physics. <laughs> because why do we do an experiment then, right? If, if my question is, is determined by, by something else, it's the end of the uh, Another possibility which has seriously been discussed is that there are actions into the past. Quantum measurement are actions into the past. But when, when your measurement determines what state is being in it. I just listen to this, I don't want to comment on it. Uh, the other one is that Basic logic is wrong. The, the, uh, what you need for basic knowledge is no knowledge of quantum mechanics, just some basic logic, very basic logic. Maybe that doesn't work. It's also not very likely. Another one is that counterfactual reasoning doesn't work. Namely, in the argument, you have not only to, to notice and use the measurement results actually obtained, but you also you should have to argue something like, I measure polarization x here, and I measure really Y here, but what would have happened if I would have measured polarization Z over there? This is counterfactual reasoning, uh, which is reasonable in every day, in everyday life. We always, we always work that way. We always think, of what would have happened if I... Maybe this, is not, this doesn't work out. Uh, the other one is maybe realism is at stake. Maybe we don't observe pictures which exist independent uh, before that, before uh, of us, before the experiment. Uh, some people argue that actually all these measurement results exist, each one in some universe, and there are many, many worlds. Uh, we have to talk about the other worlds. Uh, we, we could discuss each of these points at length. I don't want to do that now, because the final word, I would say, is not out yet. The final word is not out yet. It's going to be interesting what it will be. Uh, to me, the challenge is the following. Quantum mechanics is here to stay. There's no question. It's such a beautiful mathematical theory and so on. There could be a theory beyond which we don't know, but it's mathematically beautiful, it's actually precise. But what we don't have, and it doesn't make sense from a conceptual point of view. It makes a lot of sense uh, if I physically, if I quantum physics. Uh, but what is missing is the following. When you look at relativity theory, you have some basic principles. Uh, for example, the equivalence principle. What, right? Well, so the, 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 you have the principle that you cannot tell whether you are moving with a constant speed or address. Uh, you cannot tell the difference between an acceleration because you are in an elevator or a gravity. These are reasonable ideas. That they, and, and you require, Einstein required, that therefore the laws of physics should also not be able to tell. And that's actually very nice. I, for quantum mechanics, we are missing this kind of principle. And I hope that it exists, and I hope that, that I'm still alive with some clever young guy finds it. I want to quote someone who is very famous, Diego Rabi, you know, the discoverer of nuclear magnetic resonance. There was a conference in 1985 uh, where I was still a young scientist, celebrating this was the centennial of Niels Bohr. And he got up in the front row and he said something to He said, I think we are missing a very basic point. The next generation, when they found it, will knock on the head and say, how could they have missed it? I hope he's right, and I hope I'm still alive. Here comes an advertisement. Uh, we organized a conference in 2000 uh, at the occasion of 10 years, uh, uh, 10 years commemorating 10 years the death of, of John Bell. Uh, this was 2000. In 2014, this the last year, we organized such a conference once again at the occasion of 50 years of Bell's theorem. 
and you see 2000, 2014. So this is a, a series of conferences now. The next one is then 2000, is 2028. And I invite you all to come to Vienna 2028. The announcement is already on the web. <laughs> it's the 100th birthday of John Bell. So I think this is the longest cycle conference series which, which exists so far. The series two is not enough. About after the third one, it's a serious conference. <laughs> and this is my last slide. This is my group. And on the rooftop of our institute in Vienna, you see the telescope back there, which we are hope to use for satellite communication soon. And behind there is uh, the center of Vienna. And I hope I can welcome you all someday again. Thank you very much for your attention. And we realized that up to that moment, people had only been working on the entanglement of two objects. And we both had come up with a with the idea that maybe, oh, I think one should look at three or four. There's no thing behind it is looking for. Actually, it looked pretty boring, but we didn't know anything better. And there was a big surprise. The big surprise is that for, for, for two uh, systems, uh, you can actually, I did not tell you, for the two systems you can actually explain what is called perfect correlation. Maybe when you have the polarization here and here, measure them in the same way, independent of direction, you can explain all this in a local realistic way. And the contradiction only comes if you measure the two at an angle. So you have statistical correlation. And my feeling at that time, and the feeling of many people was that this is not surprising. Because after all, quantum mechanics is a statistical theory, and why not have a contradiction? And we found that for three and more particles, there is actually a contradiction for the subset of, 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 of definitely statistical properties. So if I have made measurement of two, and I measure the third one, and using local realism, I, for example, predict that the third photon must be horizontally polarized, there's no way out. And the local realist would predict that it must be vertically polarized. There's no way out. So it's the maximum contradiction. This is nice conceptually. Uh, it was unexpected. And again, it turned out that this might be important for quantum computation or whatsoever. And there's actually, it's actually now a PACS entry. So, so there was Greenberger. That's right. And there was Zeilinger. Right. What? Who's H? H. Uh, Mike Horn. Uh, Mike is, Horn uh, is now a professor at Stony College for a long time. All his, his life as a professor was at Stony College because he likes it, because this the equivalent of Einstein's lighthouse that he works there. He, he, he doesn't have to worry about raising funds or whatever. And Horn was, uh, was, uh, Horn was worked with Shimoni many years ago. And he invented, independent of John Gauser, who was working at Berkeley, the first uh, experimental test for phase recording. So he's in the field. He's, he's just not known as much as he should be. I'm sure there are many questions. Uh, Mark? Uh, with the conceptual ideas that you discussed, it seems to me realistic. Is the one that is from Shokoka because I think Should, what? the problems people have is they try to impose classical views of right. physics to what are called quantum mechanics. Right. If you have a quantum mechanics right. point of view, I don't see what the problem is. 
But well, as Moore already explained, unless you measure something, you can't say what right. is public. I think you referred to that at the beginning of your talk. Right. I agree. My so personal... I'm, I'm asking, do you, do you really think that there are problems? Uh, well, <clears throat> well, there is a problem. And the problem is, why is quantum mechanics? <laughs> as I said before, <coughs> why do we have quantum mechanics? There must be, a, then it, it, you could say, it is just the way we have it, that it works, <laughs> that, and we are all happy with it. Uh, but I would like to, I would like, I, I think a position is possible where we would we say in the future, may, we have to have quantum mechanics. It must be that way. It cannot be in any way different. And that is missing. In relativity theory, we have it. But not the quantum mechanics. Can I tell you what Feynman and, said? He uh, said the thing is so confusing, I can't even tell if it's a problem. Right, yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Right. You know, the problem is with, with, with realism is that, that as John Bell showed us, for example, you can, for example, explain, if you want, the double thing experiment in the local realistic world. You don't have to, but you can. And it's only in any systems where this doesn't work anymore. So realism doesn't really break down with interference here. It only breaks down in the end with the Are you happy, Mike? I know John very well, and he just couldn't, he couldn't give up. The idea that there must be some. Who? John Bell. Like, yeah. like, there must be something yeah. underlying. I find it surprising. Yeah, yeah. The fact is that yeah. experiments ever since have shown that quantum mechanics is completely consistent. By the way, all this spookiness, I think, if you look at the ground state of the helium model, it's a spin zero, two electrons and a spin zero. They're correlated. Well, that nobody was ever, actually nobody ever uh, argued about the correlations. But right, that was actually the first. So why why should the spookiness would be if those electrons separated without any interaction, and then the correlation would change? That would be mm -hmm. But as long as so, I, I, I agree with the you. fact that the correlations right. are long distance. Yes. I mean, entanglement is only interesting because you are able to separate the system over large distances, and you still get the, get these correlations, which are not just correlations of properties of the system, uh, of pro uh, uh, which, uh, uh, which, is, which the, uh, of properties the electrons have before the measurement. And that's the important point. Right? Otherwise, if they're just correlations of properties existing, nobody would care. Right? That's quite interesting. So the, uh, the two latest experiments that I know of, the entanglement swapping and the one with the stencil of a cap, show very clearly, at least to me, that entanglement is capable of carrying information across it. <coughs> but there are still a lot of people who say you can't use entanglement to carry information. Has this issue been put to bed? Can we punch them in the face yet? <laughs> you can, the point is, if, you have, if I may say it in a sloppy way, uh, you can use entanglement to send information at the price that the, that the information is encrypted in such a way that you can only decipher it after some classical additional information arrives, which is not information about the original system. It's just some additional information which, which allows you then to decipher it. Which does not mean that the system cannot be, that this faster than light thing cannot be used for something. For example, you could consider a situation where you, where you uh, teleport uh, the output of one quantum computer to the input of another quantum computer instantly, or even back into the past. And you can have the new quantum computer start riding along and calculating the results and getting the results faster than in any classical way. The only point is that you have to wait, you can only understand the result at the moment when some additional chassis signal arrives. But you still can be much faster than in any classical computation. <coughs> so it's interesting. So you can so it is not just now it, it can be used in some things if you're careful. But it cannot be used to send direct information faster than the so you don't think uh, John Kramer's experiment will succeed? Uh, uh, yes, we talked a lot with John Kramer. 
<coughs> and I think we know what will what the result will be, and we, it will not be any communication apart from the speed of light. We have had in, in, in visit in Vienna to talk to all of them. Right. So I'm one of the non-physicists in the room, right? So I want to move a question a little bit different. We talk about techniques, and there's always talk about destructive and non-destructive reading of qubits. And I'm wondering if you would spend just a minute or two talking about where do you think that's going? Do we, will we get to completely non-destructive or not? And what time frame? Well, that's a very good question. Because with photons, I usually don't worry about non-destructive detection. But there are a few of them. Uh, non-destructive detection of the state for atoms you can you can do, right? But for for photons, it's a good question. Some of us here come because of a meetup that Andre does, and he's had like like, what? some of us come because a gentleman here has a meetup here where lots of smart people like you come. Right. And he has students from around the world that talk about their research. Right. And we've had a number of people that are doing research come and talk about this exact topic. Mm -hmm. That's why that's why I asked the question, because a lot of people seem to be thinking about this and I'm a computer scientist. So right. that's my interest in right. it seems to me to be a key, a long term key, this technology. Yes. I yes, I yes, let me put it that way. Uh, um, uh, it is not something which I probably will see during my active academic life, otherwise I would be more interested in the question. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, but basically there is no reason why we should not have it someday. Maybe it's earlier than what I think. Actually it should be possible soon uh, if you are able to transfer what people have shown now, if you are able to transfer if this is a preliminary of quantum repeater, to, uh, to transfer the, the quantum state of the photon to an atom, and then observe the atom in the atom. That would be what we would do. Thank you. But I, I'm, not, I'm just guessing. Thank you. 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 You mentioned that if it were the total absolute determinism, then you would not choose working on this. But on the other hand, if total absolute determinism, then you would not have a free will to choose. Well, this is an old, bit, uh, an old long discussion, as you know. It goes back to what was it? Early comes the early people in quantum mechanics actually worry about that. Uh, if there is free will, it has nothing to do with quantum mechanics. That's my opinion. <laughs> the randomness of the randomness of the quantum event is not the explanation of free will, because the the, uh, the quantum event is random in a way that. As far as we know, that there is no written code, there is no inference in what the result will be. So there cannot also be an inference by by mind or whatever it is on that. That is just just outside physics. So then, if this is correct, then you're essentially saying that with this determinism of quantum mechanics, you would not be able to choose to work or not to work on what you're working. I have to. Well, then I have to ask you, what do you mean if you talk about me as you? <laughs> <laughs> Who is that? Who is the person? Who is... Right? What is it? What is it? What is the person? What, what, who, who would it be who determines whether he, whether the, whether he, he wants to do this or that? Yeah. I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. I have a final statement that might apply. Reality is the entanglement between quantum mechanics and general relativity. And one that's is, that's one a nice word. It should go on, on some website.
regarding the uh, uh, entanglement, does it not suggest the, the existence of uh, higher order dimensionality because of the instantaneity of the uh, correlation between uh, what, from our perspective, it looks like two certain particles? Well, there was that. There's actually literature about that. Uh, uh, there is, I think the name will come to me now. Is a, a famous, is a, uh, the, 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 Neyman. Okay. He was, you know, he was a conservative minister of science. I know you know. Yeah, right. Well, the, the first thing is correct. You are. You are, right. You are Neyman. He actually wrote, wrote papers about that. Right? He suggests that this is an indication of higher dimension. I cannot judge that. I cannot mm -hmm. do that. And, and towards this issue of, uh, of free will, do you not have free will in your choice of basis? I mean, everybody, everybody of us thinks that we have free will. But I talked to Japanese colleagues, and this raised the question. And they told me that for them, the, the, the whole concept doesn't exist. It's not necessary. Well, if, you, if you believe that it must be something from our Judai Christian background. This goes back to lunch today. You know, Richard is behaving like an entropic uh, membrane, shall we say, between the quantum realm and what we perceive as the classical realm. Then uh, would it not be that it's both cases that you have no free will on the quantum side? <laughs> yeah, you said the measurement might determine what was submitted. Can, can you explain that? Oh yeah, oh yes, it's very simple. I mean, if you, if the idea is basically that you have a measurement result uh, here, for example, horizontal along this step, and here horizontal along this step. And then you simply can explain it by assuming that the source in that instance emitted a product state horizontal times vertical, not an entangled state. But for the next photon photo pairs, it must be another state. So it's a product state. Even though you made it exactly the same way. Even you made it exactly the same way, it's a specific uh, a product state made for each of the, of the measurement results, which is completely artificial. I don't believe that it is a reasonable position. But, but I should take the quote in the possibility. OK, one more question. Uh, yes, yeah. What was the fact that the non states have never zero, actually, in Plato's uh, research? I heard you say the non entangled states have zero measure. That's true. What was the question? Yeah. What was the question? How were you to your research? Well, it turns out that many, many, many people say that Everything in the universe is entangled somehow, which I think is going a little bit too far. I don't know. I mean, entanglement, it's it. entanglement is not the exception. Entanglement is the rule. The entanglement is the rule. Yeah. It turns out that if you go to higher dimensional hyperspaces, for example, then, they, then if you write down the possible base states, most of them are entangled. And, and the product states are the very few big things. The, the, the set gets in the limit for infinite dimension, the set of non main state becomes of measure zero. Mm -hmm. It's very interesting. It's it's hmm? it's no, not in any dimension. No, no. If you go, if, if, I, if I look, for example, the possible, what is called uh, mutually unbiased base sets, which are the different ways how I can define bases in the different ways of dimension n. Then it turns out that the uh, that there is a subset where everything is just a product state. All these spaces are just product state. <coughs> but that fraction gets smaller and smaller to much larger to do larger dimensions. Okay, let's start.